Hello and Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. Naveed Iqbal and I'll be talking today about substance abuse, substance use and addiction in Pakistan. Um, these are topics that I really care about because when I moved back to Pakistan I realized uh, seeing some patients that um, there's a general lack of knowledge uh, about substance abuse uh, and substance use among medical professionals. Uh, be it psychologists, uh, even medical doctors, uh, we're just not that aware of the kind of substances that are being used and how to deal with patients or identify what they're being uh, what they're using. So uh, one of the problems was that patient that the patient ko khud nahi pata hota ki wo kya use kare, especially the ones who are not that educated. They're not aware of what substance they're using and um, what ends up happening is that people just label them as uh, whatever they think they're using. So medical professionals might mislabel um, the substance and hence the treatment for the substance might be different. So what I've done in this uh, presentation and lecture is Okay, I've researched uh, the data on, on Pakistan and what are the substances and what are the trends of substance use in Pakistan. And um, we will just work towards, uh, you know, acclimatizing ourselves and knowing, our, uh, knowing more about uh, what these drugs are, how to identify drug use just by you know how that drug makes them feel or how that substance makes them feel or how to identify when there is a problem and what are the outcomes of uh, substance use or that particular substance's outcomes so that we can let the client uh, or the patient know that uh, these this is what you are heading towards. Um, so let's uh, get started and see what, you know, uh, we can, hopefully we all can learn something from here. So uh, first up, uh, we talk about, uh, these are some statistics, overall statistics. Uh, mind you, this research was done in 2013 uh, with the uh, WHO and uh, so, Things have just escalated since then. It has not gone down. Uh, up, so over here it says 4.25 million people are considered dependent on substances. That's 2.3% of your population. Um, so these are people who are not casual user, users or who are not abusing the drug. These are people who are dependent and need help. Uh, what is unfortunate is that the facility all over Pakistan to treat people uh, such as rehabs or inpatient psychiatric facilities that take addiction or addiction centers, these in total can only treat 30,000 patients or clients. Whereas you can see the problem is far bigger than that. So there's a gap that is never filled and people, unfortunately, most of them are our society just shuns them, tells ignores them or hides them if their family you know is able to otherwise people just throw those suffering from addiction onto the streets and they just live on the streets until they unfortunately pass away so uh, this all can be changed if we uh, raise awareness if we help people early on so um, let's talk about uh, what drugs are being used and over here you can see a list of uh, seven most common uh, drugs or categories of drugs that uh, are used in Pakistan. Um, and the reason they're in this order is because according to the data we have, uh, this is the most, it is going from most used to least used. So by far the most used substance and that was over 4 million people back in 2013. Uh, we're using cannabis, marijuana, hashish, whatever you might call it. Four million people are using it. Uh, then comes benzodiazepines and other tranquilizers or uh, sedatives. Um, the third number pay is heroin and other opioids such as synthetic opioids, painkillers and things like that. Then people use injectable anesthetics and that's a huge array of uh, drugs that can be used in that. 
Uh, number five is something that is really growing and is making rounds in the news these days. Uh, methamphetamine, commonly and colloquially known here as ICE. Uh, number six, there is alcohol use and abuse. And finally, there is cocaine use. Um, so how we'll go through this is we'll first cover some definitions and then we will start getting into individual uh, substance or drug and talk about that. So what are the common methods that people use drugs? So some people might say, um, you know, I cigarette me dal ke peeta hon, main is, I snort, I inject. So these are things that we need to know what they're talking about, right? So uh, one of the easiest things is ingesting pills. So things like the second common we just talked about is um, benzodiazepines are commonly known here as sleeping pills. Um, Wo are usually uh, taken, you just take the pill like you take medication. Then there's smoking and inhalation. So um, how this is done is there are a number of ways to do this. What people commonly use is they take a cigarette, they cut it open, they add the um, drug onto the tobacco, they roll the cigarette back and they light it and smoke it. Uh, you can also, there's rolling paper um, and you can make joints out of it. Joint is just uh, rolled up, you know, uh, crushed cannabis or um, any other medication or any other drug that you can add. There's also other ways over here it shows uh, a pipe so you can smoke it through a pipe, different pipes for different uh, drugs. You can also use something that is called uh, as a bong so uh, you light the drug at one end, the fumes and the vapors from it go through water and then filter out and then come out the other end and you inhale it. So anything that is to do with inhalation that is uh, comes under this category. There's another commonly used uh, term we will cover later when it comes when we come discuss uh, particular use for every drug. Um, then there's injecting um, and people can inject into their veins which is the IV intravenous or they can inject the drug into their muscles be it their thighs arms wherever they can find spot so that's the intramuscular over here um, these are harder drugs and uh, you know people who are injecting especially in their vein are uh, universally are really really addicted and need help uh, finally, there's uh, encephalation, uh, commonly known as snorting. So uh, what usually happens is if you get a drug which is in powder form or if you get like a medication, a pill, a tablet, uh, people crush the tablet into fine little powder. Um, you movies in movies, usually uh, you uh, make these lines using a razor or any or a card or anything you roll up um, a piece of paper usually a ten dollar bill or you know the beast rupega note karke, and then they uh, block one of the nostrils and then they suck in uh, through the other this way it's a fast way to get the drug and medication into your system it reaches crosses the blood brain barrier easily uh, dissolves into the blood vessels in your nose and your sinuses and you get an instant reaction or instant hit from it. So these are four methods which are very common um, ways universally to take drugs. Uh, people are very creative in uh, you know, taking uh, drugs or using drugs. So there are other methods that are used as well. Okay, uh, so before we start, uh, these are some definitions that we need to know because our people say that there is tolerance or there is withdrawal. So we need to understand what these terms mean or, uh, before we label someone with something. So let's talk about tolerance here. It says a state where the body no longer responds to a drug um, the same way um, when uh, with the same amount um, that was being used. So what happens is that uh, people have to increase the amount of uh, the drug they're taking. Let's just take the example of alcohol. Uh, someone who drinks, you know, three drinks 
uh, per night after a couple of months they don't feel the same buzz with three drinks a night they have to go to four five six and this keeps on going up and up because you develop tolerance to the drug your body becomes uh, tolerant and uh, used to uh, having that drug so it does not have the same effect so you increase the dose um, dependence uh, is uh, where the a person functions normally only in the presence of a drug so we'll talk about later once again using the example of alcohol uh, where people cannot function without the drug anymore they wake up the first thing they want to do uh, in uh, the morning is to uh, have a drink and that is because uh, they cannot open their eyes, they cannot function, they cannot get out of bed. Similarly, people who have, um, uh, who are using other substances might go through this, where uh, they just are now dependent on the drug or the medication. Uh, finally, there's withdrawal. So what is withdrawal? Withdrawal is basically abnormal physical or psychological symptoms that you experience when you're not taking the drug anymore. So uh, things like, you know, tremors or um, things like, uh, you know, vomiting, nausea in case of heroin are things that uh, we might need to consider when we're talking about withdrawal. When you don't drug, your body can the same thing that you like. So now it is acting up. It wants that drug again. But once you're not getting it, it will, uh, you know, act up and um, give, present you with some nasty symptoms. So uh, what is important is, uh, important to know is that there are three or at least technically there used to be three categories um, first of all was substance abuse uh, sorry substance use then there's substance abuse and then there's uh, addiction so there's a difference between the three it's a spectrum it's not a clear-cut thing whereas uh, so if you see Western societies uh, or places where alcohol is integrated into culture there are uh, people drink alcohol and even in Pakistan some mo uh, most of the people who drink alcohol or consume alcohol are uh, casual users they are drug users or you know substance users uh, whereas the so we cannot say if someone goes on a weekend goes out on a weekend drinks two drinks and comes back he is addicted because he's not he's using a substance then comes a state where you are abusing the substance and then eventually or you know maybe that never happens comes a state where you are addicted to a substance so those are different scenarios so one four major differences in this is are mentioned over here so uh, number one it says substance abuse can appear casually while uh, addiction has serious problems. So the same example as I said, we can pizake do drinks ko pita hai, that is that or cha drinks pita, let's say. That's abuse. But where when it's addiction is that that same person will have a drink every day. He'll have four drinks every day. Okay. Um, addiction is when you have withdrawal symptoms. Uh, or significant withdrawal symptoms. Uh, substance abuse, you do not have withdrawal symptoms. So people who smoke uh, cigarettes will sometimes tell you, Ki, I can quit any time because uh, any symptoms nahi hoti, withdrawal nahi hoti. so they might be users. Um, then it says, um, addiction is considered a mental disorder or disease, while substance abuse is not necessarily a diagnosis. I um, Disagree with this because we will cover in a bit where DSM-5 has uh, changed the definitions and uh, there is uh, substance abuse and substance uh, and addiction are two different diagnoses. Um, anyway, then uh, number four, uh, substance abuse alters the brain briefly while uh, addiction alters the brain permanently. And that... Um, is true when uh, there's something known uh, there's a phenomena known as the addictive brain um, in psychology it's just very common how someone who has an addictive personality and uh, how their brain function has changed and um, how 
they and there have been studies done uh, neurophysiological studies that show the actual um, structure of the brain changing in people who were suffering from addiction okay so dsm-5 as we all know is a set of rules a criteria a book that dictates um in the u.s that dictates or gives you definition or criteria for every disorder so uh what has happened from dsm-4 to dsm-5 is that uh the criteria has changed uh it talked about um uh, it has now defined things uh, in a broader perspective. So the major category here is substance-related and addictive disorders. Um, so under that is further divided into substance use disorders and addictive disorders. So um, let's say, so, and then they, it goes through each um, substance. So let's say, first example uh, in the DSM is alcohol. So it will then go into details. So similarly, it goes into caffeine uh, and cannabis and opioids and all these categories have different definitions. Uh, and they're subdivided into, let's say, in alcohol, it's like alcohol use disorder, uh, alcohol intoxication, alcohol withdrawal, other alcohol induced disorders, unspecified alcohol related disorders. So all these disorders, they just substitute alcohol alcohol with like cannabis or heroin or opioids or something of that sort so the categories remain the same uh, I have put the while we were talking about alcohol I put the uh, disorders and the definition or the criteria for uh, alcohol use disorder uh, here uh, I've not put for other uh, drugs and substances later on because it's honestly the same uh, as we continue so there's no need to go into details or post this again and again you can use this as kind of a framework to uh, judge uh, the criteria for others briefly going through this uh, you have to have a couple of these in order to understand uh, so it says at least two of the followings uh, within the 12 month period. It's very self-explanatory, you can go through it. For instance, one says, large amount of alcohol is consumed, efforts to cut down, great deal of time spending uh, getting alcohol, drinking alcohol, recovering from alcohol, great cravings, failure at school or social responsibilities. Um, you know, seeing that there's, uh, that the substance is causing problems, but still using it is uh, one, and then, uh, you know, if you go on, so there's, uh, it also talks about tolerance and withdrawal. So once we have two of these at least, then we know that person has, uh, is suffering, according to the DSM-5, uh, uh, with alcohol use disorder, okay? Uh, so what, uh, so that's a huge list to remember. I mean, it's counterintuitive, it's uh, very intuitive, sorry, um, to, Go through it. Apko vaisi sense banti hai kya gazada pire hai, unki social life factor hai, this, this, and that. So uh, those are things that um, you know should be uh, self-explanatory. But uh, at the same time, uh, we have uh, what we could do is uh, we need something more concise. Especially this works and is tested for alcohol. We use it in the medical field a lot. It's very simple. It's called a cage questionnaire. Uh, C A G E, and what it is is basically um, it talks about um, have you ever tried to cut down on your drinking? That's the C for cut down. Ha are people annoyed and criticize you for your drinking? That's A. Uh, have you ever felt guilty about uh, drinking? That's the G. And have you needed a drink early morning to? open your eyes so eye opener is the e if you have two or more of these then uh that's concerning and that indicates that you might be suffering from uh addiction and uh this can be substituted so c b same rega a b g b eye opener b you can use this for other um substances such as uh cannabis or heroin or opioids or anything um so it even though it is strictly for alcohol, I assume for our intents and purposes, this can be a, a good framework to start uh, asking these questions uh, to our clients or patients. 
while we were on the topic of alcohol, um, I thought uh, we can start with it and then we'll go uh, according to um, the list we had of commonly used uh, substances. So alcohol, uh, according to research, not commonly used in Pakistan, um, but from what I uh, have experienced and I see, there's two peaks. If you see uh, the socioeconomic graph of alcohol use, the two peaks, one is the uh, people in villages who are not very educated. What they're drinking is homebrew. They make their uh, alcohol themselves and drink that. And then the other are upper middle class or higher upper uh, class who are, have the ability to afford alcohol and they uh, you know, uh, have bootleggers or dealers who are able to su supply uh, alcohol to them common amongst college going students and um, most typically middle aged uh, people of wealthy background. Um, so what does it look like? Alcohol, uh, I'm sure a lot of people know how it looks like. It is a spirit. So depending on what type of alcohol there is, uh, it will look different colors. For instance, vodka is transparent whereas whiskey might be brown and you know uh, what what is uh, important for us clinically to know is that there is difference between hard liquor and uh, things like beer and uh, wine which have far less concentration of alcohol so a glass of wine is not the same as a glass uh, or a drink of let's say um, brandy or uh, whiskey so that is to keep in mind because alcohol in beer or wine is uh, wine is usually 12% or less or even less than that. Um, beer is very diluted, so 5% at um, for most commercial beers, whereas uh, the percentage of alcohol in um, let's say vodka is up to 40%. Uh, so there's a difference in that. So why might people say, so not everyone, as I said, some people from um, in the villages or some people who are not that uh, informed might not use the term alcohol or beer or whatever they're drinking. What they would say is things like, you know, sharab, dairu, um, there's something, uh, they, apparently they also call it dava and dawai and botal. Uh, there's something called uh, desi tarra and or they see shrad it's basically that is something that we need to be really concerned about as healthcare professionals what this is is this is uh, what i was talking about earlier this is a home brew people brew it at home what happens is the dangers of that are that you do not ferment the alcohol completely to ethanol and uh, it is left to have uh, methanol which causes blindness uh, so that is really concerning if someone calls in and says that i brew alcohol at home or uh you know we need to let them know that these are immediate consequences that's not a consequence let's say 10 years down the lane that's a consequence you could you know face uh, a couple of months or weeks from there uh how is it used um it's just you drink alcohol um People might drink it directly, people might uh, mix it, uh, especially hard liquor, people might mix it with um, soft drinks such as soda, Coke, Pepsi, Sprite, whatever, uh, or, or some juice. Um, but we need to know um, back to the point where I was talking about hard liquor and uh, beer and wine, we need to see how much the person's drinking because it's the quantity of alcohol that might, um, that would affect the effects of it the more you drink the more intoxicated you are the bad uh the worst is for your health okay so how does alcohol feel you take a drink uh 20 minutes pass by you feel um your mood's better you have more confidence um there's this lack of inhibition so let's say i was out somewhere and uh, in a gathering and I'm a shy person and I'm not able to talk to people so uh, I have a few drinks and then I'm not that shy anymore and that's mostly why people drink uh, alcohol in gatherings uh, it reduces anxiety uh, some of the negative symptoms are that uh, your uh, words would be slurred 
so you might slow down you might um you know mumble up the words because your coordination and your brain functioning is being kind of poisoned so uh, but that usually comes later on when you uh when you're really intoxicated so the problem is coordination problems you might not be able to walk straight you'll bump into things uh so that's another thing eventually sedation so uh, alcohol is an uh, interesting uh, substance because it works both as um, uh, upper and a downer what uppers and downers are if you go back here uh, into the slide we had initially so uh, their uppers are um, substances that lift you up your mood is better you're more energetic downers are things that uh, relax you you'll fall asleep you will be um, you know very relaxed so over here um, just by chance it just goes the list goes from um, downers to uh, uppers so cannabis benzodiazepines heroines injectable uh, anesthetics these all things help you relax you fall asleep you are calm whereas methamphetamine small doses of alcohol and cocaine these are things that uh, lift up your mood you're more active uh, you're able to do a lot of things okay but uh, coming back to alcohol uh, how um, that is both because when you start drinking alcohol you get an energy surge you have all these symptoms you lack of inhibitions you're more confident but as you keep getting intoxicated and keep on drinking more um, you will uh, see that uh, your uh, those sedative effects or the downer effects keep kicking and you won't be able uh, you'll fall asleep uh, as people pass out or black out where they don't remember what happened and they just fall asleep because they're so intoxicated so what are the dangers associated so when a client calls us or uh, you know a patient comes to your clinic um, you uh, you tell them about the dangers of drug abuse right so in small quantities people drink alcohol that's okay if they're aware of what they're doing uh, but um, you know they need to know that there are consequences of it so let's say as I was talking about there's impaired coordination you are not able to walk so uh, you kind of bump into things you might fall down so old people sometimes fall down or and that can hurt them a lot uh, what happens and what usually makes the rounds and news over here uh, in Pakistan is that a lot of people uh, because they're young mostly young people who go out to let's say a friend's house or parties and then uh, they drink a lot and then they get into behind a wheel to go back home rather than taking a taxi because for whatever reason uh, and usually what ha happens is that people feel confident uh, because they have had the last drink 10 minutes before leaving and they're like oh you know I don't feel drunk but alcohol levels rise slowly in the body and when they start getting behind the wheels alcohol kicks in their coordination is out of whack they cannot stop the car before ends up what ends up happening is that some poor guy on the streets who is just walking minding their own business is run over just because someone was intoxicated behind the wheel so highly discourage people not to drive not to ride a motorcycle or anything um, when under the influence of alcohol uh, you make poor decisions and choices when intoxicated usually let's take the example here of being at a party um, young people college going students are at a party um, they might do things that they would not have when they were not intoxicated they as we said inhibitions are low so they might do things that they might regret you might end up being a victim uh, by someone who is there to prey on you be it financially they could rob you you could be so intoxicated that you would not be able to provide consent and this unfortunately there's a chance of sexual harm so uh, those are things that people need to be educated upon uh, and to use the substance in moderate amount and where they can control it um, coming back to the point of homebrew when they, they see uh, sharab or uh, they see tara the problem with that is that it has methanol can cause blindness in just a few doses as well 
uh, and then there's like chronic use of alcohol uh, over years if you keep on abusing alcohol apart from all those other problems that you have there's serious health problems you'll develop chronic liver failure failure that is irreversible so you would the only solution out of that would be a liver transplant and at least what happens in the west is that you are far below on the transplant list if you um, are if your liver failure is because of alcoholic hepatitis uh, because it is thought that you kind of led yourself to it that's a different debate but the problem is that you can have serious health consequences both on your cardiovascular system so your heart your liver your lungs your um, kidneys all are affected and especially your mental functioning is affected uh, finally and this is a little there's something called a hangover so what happens is that alcohol depletes your body from uh, nutrients and electrolytes um, you and if you drink a lot you fall asleep uh, not knowing and in the morning when you wake up you feel terrible you, the symptoms are um, that of a headache you have um, you know you feel like you have to vomit you don't want to look at light um, bright lights give you uh, a terrible headache um, you don't feel like doing anything or getting out of bed so think of it like if you drink heavily on a Tuesday night and you have to go to work you might not be able to do go to work and you can call in sick once twice but if you're abusing alcohol on a daily basis you might not be able to do that and that would affect your work and social life and so on and so forth so those are serious dangers of alcohol so what are withdrawal symptoms and how they come to play is uh, usually these are not for casual users. These are seen in people who um, are abusing alcohol for a long uh, time and are dependent on it. The alcohol withdrawal is honestly one of the things that would kill you. Uh, there are other very harmful drugs such as heroin and they have nasty withdrawals but uh, a heroin withdrawal would be terrible. You would feel really, really bad, and you'd wish that you, you know, it was all over. But you would not die from a heroin withdrawal in most cases. But in a true alcohol withdrawal, you will definitely there's a high a possibility that you would die. So what happens is someone, a typical patient who has used or a typical client who has used alcohol for let's say eight years on a daily basis, now uh, leaves alcohol are uh, for three days after three days this is what's going to happen and they will definitely come into the hospital uh, they, their heart rate would be really high blood pressure would be high uh, they would be sweating their hands would have a tremor so you'd see literal shaking of the hands uncontrollable not under the patient's control they'll be uh, insomnia they won't be able to sleep they'll be vomiting there'll be agitation anxiety uh, can lead to seizures but the most important thing that it can and the most dangerous thing it can do is something called delirious tremors or DT what happens in DT is that uh, people start hallucinating so uh, you feel most commonly what people feel uh, is that their ants crawling all over them that's what's called tactile or physical hallucinations you feel something on your body you hear things you see things I had a patient who came in after a long flight stopped drinking alcohol two days before the flight straight from the airport came into the hospital because he thought he was possessed he was seeing the devil in the curtains off uh, the emergency room and we literally had to tie him down on physical restraints because he was freaking out and that's just because he was using alcohol daily or abusing alcohol daily for three years and now suddenly quit and uh, with the high heart rate the heart rate can shoot up you can have brain aneurysm or your heart can actually stop so this these patients need to be uh, admitted to the hospital so what we can do uh, is that if someone calls in and says I want to quit I've been drinking for three years four years constantly every day what do I do you refer them to a psychiatrist or ask them to check into a rehab facility because alcohol withdrawal is a serious deal and um, it can really be deadly. 
So what is the treatment? Uh, briefly, as we talked about, treatment is discontinuation. If there's casual users, discontinuation. Um, maybe if they're just casual users, cut down on the alcohol. Uh, then um, most important thing uh, is supportive therapy. So Alcoholics Anonymous, AA, are very uh, helpful in this. This is a group of people who sit around and talk about their experiences. All of them are sober now and have stopped uh, using alcohol or abusing alcohol, and they all want to help each other. There are groups in every city. Uh, I know for a fact that Lahore has one, and they meet every Sunday. So uh, th th these are very welcoming people, and they support you. They'll be a sponsor. A sponsor is someone who uh, will be there for you, who has been sober and has uh, quit using alcohol for some time and will help you in any uh, case possible. So these are very uh, helpful groups in alcohol, obviously counseling therapy. Uh, these people might be using or abusing drugs for other reasons and we need to find out uh, through therapy and counseling what uh, the problem is and get to the core of that. Uh, as I said, uh, chronic users might be need to be hospitalized uh, before they quit. Um, uh, you tell them to visit a psychiatrist, consult a psychiatrist because they might be uh, they might, you know, get them to use uh, medications like benzodiazepines to calm them uh, with their withdrawals. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it about alcohol. Um, the next, we go to the most common drug used in uh, Pakistan, and I would assume worldwide, uh, the most common used drug is a cannabis around 4 million people uh, yearly use the drug at any given time uh, it is estimated that 4% of the population uses it also this is survey data we need to keep in mind and also this was done in 2013 there's no updated data I am pretty sure there are way more people using cannabis now in 2019 than they were in 2013 and there are more people who do not report using uh, cannabis Cannabis is very popular, um, once again, amongst young adults or even kids in their late teens, uh, unfortunately. Uh, this is one drug that is, uh, I would say, even though it has more prevalence amongst men, but this is a drug or substance that is being used quite frequently by both uh, men and women uh, in Pakistan. Uh, the stigma associated with it has been reduced over the years, which just propagates uh, the use and the access. So this is this and hashish are easily or readily uh, available in Pakistan because of the Afghan-Pakistan border. Anyway, uh, and that explains why the most common uh, it's most commonly used in KPK and in synth. Uh, research shows that people are uh, begin using uh, most commonly at 19 years of age and the peak use is uh, in those with 33 years of age. Um, let's uh, talk about how it looks like. So um, basically it's technically marijuana is a leaf, it's a plant that grows uh, on a cannabis plant you dry it off, uh, dry off the bud of the leaf, it's green dried off plant, uh, then uh, people process it into make it into hashish which is this black brown tar mixture um, or paste. Uh, so I'll, in the next slide I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, the local names uh, for this are, there's a huge list, so commonly known as Jars, Hashish or Hash, uh, Garda, Dota, uh, uh, edible or drinkable form is called pung mixed with uh, the cannabis butter or uh, oil mixed in um, milk. Then uh, some western terms uh, popular in urban areas are pot, weed, joint and a joint in Urdu is called uh, jola. Uh, Anyway, so how is it consumed? Usually once again consumed in a cigarette, you open up a cigarette, uh, you add the uh, cannabis or hashish in it, you roll back, light it, you smoke, inhale. Uh, you could also uh, use it, especially hashish, you can use by using uh, something called panni. 
what you use is you take an aluminum for piece of aluminum foil you hold it uh, you put the drug on it heat it with a lighter underneath it would heat this up and fumes would be released and you uh, inhale the fumes through your mouth or your nose uh, with the help of a straw uh, as I said, it can be mixed into milk uh, to create pung. Uh, very less common in Pakistan, but in the Western world, more common is things like edibles, where you basically extract the active components um, THC from the cannabis plant and add it to because it's fat soluble it can be added to butter once you have butter you can basically make anything from candies to brownies to anything uh, so but not very common in Pakistan so over here if you look uh, there is the plant dried off buds of cannabis they're usually green in color once again are rare to find in Pakistan uh, mostly this farm on the right uh, is farmed in Pakistan this is hashish made into a mixture into pellets uh, you break it down into little balls and use that uh, an example of that over here a joint being rolled with a mixture of dried off plant and these little balls or pellets of hashish you roll it eventually it looks like this uh, just like a cigarette and you smoke it okay um, so how does smoking or consuming uh, cannabis feels? Smoking is rapid, so uh, in a matter of five to, you know, three to five minutes, you'll feel it after smoking. Uh, you'll have slow perception of time. Everything stops. Uh, there's, you feel relaxed. Uh, there's abstract thinking and philosophical thinking, so you would wonder, you know, purpose of life and things like that. Uh, this heightened sense of taste and smell and everything so uh, this leads to a common phenomenon known as munchies because uh, you feel that you want to eat and food tastes much better because the receptors are more receptive to uh, food and taste there's pain relief there's uh, weightlessness uh, there is you feel weightless like your body is stoned um, you might sit in a place feeling very relaxed um, then uh, some of the negative symptoms uh, or some of the telltale times someone might call in and say my kid comes in he's very aloof his eyes are red so most probably they're consuming cannabis uh, their mouth is also dry and that's something that's common with most of these uh, substances so what are the dangers associated with cannabis use? So as you might know, worldwide, especially in the US, they are legalizing cannabis just like alcohol because it is thought to be not as addictive and dangerous, uh, which is true, but this everything should be done in moderation. And uh, over there, there's actual shops and like a huge industry that is making standardized uh, uh, cannabis products in Pakistan, there's not. And you don't know what you're smoking. You don't know how much you're smoking. You don't know, um, you know, the consequences, the legal consequences of it as well. So that's uh, one of the issues. Uh, the bigger issue is, especially when you're younger, so your brain kind of still develops till 25 to 23 to 25 years of age. Uh, before that, if you consume uh, a psychoactive substance like cannabis, especially, it increases the chance uh, or predisposition for psychosis. So that is a uh, big concern especially in people who are younger uh, in everyone else there's something called a motivational syndrome so when you smoke uh, or you consume cannabis you're really content with whatever's happening at that moment that's why the whole image of a couch potato is uh, perpetuated uh, with cannabis you'll smoke up you'll sit down stone happy with whatever is happening so uh, th eventually you lose motivation to do much else than to just stay home so someone i see examples a lot of uh younger people who get into smoking casually and then what happens is that they start smoking at home and uh they whatever they were doing uh in the past they were socializing they start to cancel that and prefer staying in and consuming cannabis uh, on their own and they're happy with it so social life and school life and all of that is affected 
we talk about social uh, isolation then especially for men there's something there's weight gain for uh, all but the, for men especially there's something called gynecomastia which is basically development of uh, breast tissue uh, along with gaining weight uh, in other parts of the body eventually yes uh, as with any other medication or drug there's physical dependence um, what are the withdrawal symptoms? So a cannabis usually does not have that strong of a withdrawal, but as I mentioned, more of a psychological withdrawal than a physical one. But things uh, known for chronic users are restlessness, irritability, anger, anxiety, depression, sleep difficulties, uh, and decreased appetite. What is the treatment uh, you taper off? The drug you try to cut down just like smoking you try to cut down um, you encourage people to cut down if it's affecting their social life or their personal life uh, you discontinue this substance altogether uh, you provide a social network if they're saying that oh I'm being you know pressured to use this or all my friends are using it maybe they need to find better friends or they need to find uh, hang out with those friends when they are not smoking uh, as always counseling and therapy and eventually if they cannot if they have withdrawal symptoms and they cannot deal with quitting the drug they might need uh, to see a psychiatrist who might put them on medication such as antidepressants if needed okay so uh, second now we uh, come to the second most common drug or substance use in Pakistan um, the problem this is very alarming I found this paper uh, and I'll share the research statistics with you. This is honestly was for me very concerning as a medical doctor. Uh, the usage in a uh, peri urban population, and this is like suburbs, make Karachi, may who with research, is uh, 12 14 percent of the population is using it. Ye research is not like you go to people's houses and you ask your medical good condition many this is overall in those two populations uh generally and 14 percent of the people said uh we use uh some sort of benzodiazepines um compared to, to the us which is very liberal on all kinds of drugs especially opioids and prescription medication they're 5.2% of the population was using this. Uh, mind you, these once again, this research was done in 2011, so there's a little outdated. Lake and I, once again, I assume the problem is, still remains at large. The mean age is uh, 51 years of a old. Um, majority of the users, 67% were females. Uh, alarmingly, 44% of uh, those uh, were housewives. 31% uh, had uh, no formal education whatsoever and the use was prevalent in people with less education as well. Um, the mean, and this is surprising, the mean duration was uh, three years, 144 weeks people were using this. So this is not casual, you know, use and abuse. This is serious long-term chronic abuse of uh, medication which can be deadly um, so uh, another alarming fact was 75% of these people who were using it had not seen a psychiatrist so psychiatrists Kipasni gay the majority of these were just getting it over the counter asking people pharmacists to get him uh, getting a prescription from a relative most of the times not getting a prescription whatsoever yeah pair being prescribed by a GP so uh, that is also that's the basically the core of the problem here without prescription uh, what I've noticed uh, over here is that the big name pharmacies uh, or uh, you know brand pharmacies do not sell these without prescription they would ask you uh, for a prescription for uh, like there's a ton of pharmacies every and around every corner there's a pharmacy and sometimes you might just pay them you know 50 rupees more and they'll tell them sometimes you don't even have to pay them just ask for the medication they'll give you um, the favorite and I've known this before the research as well 
just through the limited clinical experience that I've had here, is uh, Luxotinil. That's the brand name commonly Luxotinil. Look at the uh, the chemical name in uh, is bromazepam. It's a uh, medium acting uh, benzodiazepine. Um, other uh, so other names for uh, bromazepam are uh, Luxotinil ke alawa, because um, medications have different names, but um, they one and the same thing. So Luxotinil is also sold uh, under the names uh, locally as Sakun relaxing and amaze so you see how this is a problem as well it's a big problem in the u.s like in pakistan maybe this is a problem where these medications are being labeled as or are given very glorified name because people who are on and that that explains why people who are um who have less amount of knowledge or awareness or education fall for these they're like and they already call the medication literally sakun so they would be prescribed that or uh relaxing or i want to feel amazing so amazed so these things uh there needs to be regulation of this and um people need to be told the truth about these medications or not uh, what i need i want you to know is k uh, from what I with the demographics of the game housewives are using this um, it is basically something that people do not really concern themselves okay this is a bad drug or this is a drug as well this they're just like oh we use this medication because doctor this is uh, the problem with uh, these are that they are uh, labeled as uh, sleeping pills uh which they're not there's a whole medically there's a whole different category of medications that are you know sedatives and hypnotics these are anti-anxiety medication that have a side effect of uh sleep so um people use these uh let's talk about how they're taken because they're a medication they're taken uh in tablet or capsule forms there are some injections that are available, but not a lot of people use those injections because they're harder to get. Even those shady pharmacies that give you tablets will not give you, uh, let's say, a Valium injection uh, because, you know, it looks dangerous and those can really be deadly. Uh, local names, uh, as I said, sleeping pills kaha jata hai ne yaan par aram ki sakoon ki goli de di doctor ne. Uh, most of the time, people don't even know what they're taking. Uh, um, and I've listed uh, the the brand names for commonly used medications. So the most common, as I said, was Lexotinil, uh, which is bromazepam, also known as Sakoon, Relax and Amaze. Uh, then the second most commonly uh, abused uh, uh, benzodiazepine here um, is uh, Valium, which is a diazepam, um, also an immediate uh, moderate acting uh, benzodiazepine, which um, also sold in the name as uh, Wastepam or Cerulean. Then I'd say the third most abused um, benzodiazepine in Pakistan is Alprazolam, which is commonly known as Xanax. But in Pakistan, uh, the most popular brand uh, from what I hear is ALP. So ALP kehte hain log ya ALP. This is being sold. Uh, other brands are Zenith and uh, Nuxim. Then there's clonazepam, uh, which uh, is sold as a uh, revotril or um, epizep, naze, uh, magura. These are not as attractive names. And clonazepam is a long-acting uh, anti-anxiety medication so people don't really use it because they, it does not have immediate effects that way um, then there's temazepam uh, market made this is short uh, very hard to get um, this is very strong from uh, compared to all of these uh, this really puts someone to sleep easily uh, known as a restoril calm hypnotin once again you see the problematic names over here very attractive for someone who's having trouble for sleeping or something uh, how is it used um, once again taken orally some of them come in drop forms you can take drops with a dropper and their syrups and injections but most commonly a lot of people take tablets 
सो हाउ डज इट फील वाई डू पीपल टेक इट द प्रॉब्लम इज आपके घर में एक हाउस वाइफ हैं शी हेज सम मैरिटल इशूज शी हैज स्ट्रेस शी हेज टू डील विद चिल्ड्रन शी हेज टू डील विद हर हजबेंड शी हैज अंडर लाइंग यू नो पर हैप्स डिप्रेशन और एनजाइटी दैट शी नेवर एक्चुअली यू नो डेल्ट विद और टू बी ऑनेस्ट इन आर कल्चर दिस नॉट लॉट ऑफ आई फ्रॉम वट आई सी दिस कम्युनिकेशन गैप्स तो लोग कम्युनिकेट नहीं करते अपनी बात को दूसरे के साथ वट एंड अप हैपनिंग इज दैन दैट कॉज स्ट्रेस मैन एंड दिस इज वट द रिसर्च से इज मैन यूजली आर स्पेंड मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम और मेजोरिटी ऑफ देयर टाइम और बिग चंक ऑफ देयर टाइम आउटसाइड द हाउस वेन देयर इन मोस्ट केसेज इन पाकिस्तान देयर द ब्रेड विनर्स सो दे गो आउट स्पेंड uh half the day at work so they don't have to do what poor what happens with the women is that um they're mostly at home especially housewives so they don't get that outlet they uh have you know moved into a different house there's so many stressors so uh and they don't have healthy ways to cope with it they don't have a social circle they don't have uh other things so what ends up happening is they want to they feel all uh they want to feel relaxed and then someone tells them aap ye jeet relaxin kha le ya amaze kha le ya luxotin kha le and they have one and then they feel good so they continue having that without knowing the consequences of it so uh what how it feels like is you have this mild euphoria and pleasure you feel good this anxiety relief and that's why what it's prescribed to people who need it because they they're suffering from anxiety and there's relaxation and then there is a side effect of sedation and that's the problem where people use these to fall asleep when that's just a, a subsidiary effect of these medications the prominent effect is to relax you and calm your brain and that's why these medications are also used when people have seizures mirgi ka daura pad raha hai hil raha hai koi to aap diazepam uh valium uh inject kar dete hain unhe it just slows the brain so in epilepsy your brain is firing really uh fast and your your whole body is moving these things just calm down the brain uh physically so uh this is what they're doing on a lower scale or smaller scale when you're taking tablets what are the dangers associated with it so the problem with taking those medications are mostly long term and they're short term problems as well that's like alcohol of uh, uh, higher doses can impair your movement so you might bump into things you might end up into an accident you might fall asleep or um at different places uh there's extreme drowsiness uh these are complicated medications which have interaction so as we saw average age 51 se above the 51 se above yahan par pakistan mein or anywhere in the world people are on one or mostly polytherapy of other drugs kisi ko heart problem hai kisi ko you know kidney problem hai and then you you're adding another pharmacological agent on top of it without asking a doctor or without consulting them then that can cause interactions with other medications but the most important thing is ke okay, it causes memory loss so things with memory your short short term memory is gone so if you go on a binge uh, abusing these medications especially in higher doses you might end up and i have seen patients who come to the hospital or come to the uh, uh, clinic and they say doc sahab mujhe yaad nahi pichle do hafte kya hua tha it's just a haze and that's true because they don't remember think the ability to formulate memories is taken away from them because of the medication so uh you can see how that is dangerous because they can you know take decisions that they don't remember say things that they don't remember uh do things that they don't remember and when we're talking about things like tamazepam and a stronger benzodiazepines they have also been used as things as sinister as day trip drugs where someone would give you koi aapke drink pe mila dega koi aap a malabini if you're taking it especially by yourself and you go on to a party or you go meet someone and then you don't know what's going to happen because you won't remember it and they know that you won't remember it so that leaves you very vulnerable to uh a lot of things what are the withdrawal symptoms so once again just like alcohol where uh it does not seem bad or the medication other effects do not seem bad but the withdrawal can be deadly 
2 and very severe. Uh, once again, I've seen patients with benzodiazepine withdrawal, people who have gone on a binge for, you know, two months, uh, suddenly stop taking benzodiazepines and they these people did not have panic attacks or anxiety before but now they experience panic attacks and anxiety and uh, it is really bad because they will have tremors they'll have sweating so same things as we talked about for alcohol pretty much tremors sweating muscle pains they would not be able to concentrate the memory lapses are still there they, uh, eventually long-term memory loss can happen there'll be nausea vomiting insomnia depression a whole melee of things that would happen uh, because you stop taking uh, uh, benzodiazepines. Um, so what is the treatment? Uh, the treatment is detoxification. You need to get out, get these out. It takes about three to four weeks after your last dose to get them out of your system. You uh, taper these medications uh, down that's how you do it because otherwise you'll have severe uh, you know withdrawal symptoms and can be really dangerous so you have to see a psychiatrist you tell the patient especially to humnebat give women who are taking them for more than three uh, years you ask them to cut down go consult a psychiatrist uh, to cut cut down uh, on these medications um, and uh, obviously there's counseling and therapy so you tell them because you know once uh, the, the depression sets in or other things set in uh, you experience those things uh, with it okay moving on to uh, the third most abused uh, substance in Pakistan is heroin um, are opium basically opioids uh, mostly uh, used in Pakistan as heroin um, 860,000 people use heroin uh, on um, in Pakistan at any given time that that's many users the prevalence is uh, significant uh, most common in 21 years and above 73 percent of the people using it are thankfully above uh, 21 years of age uh, there are younger people using it. Uh, there, 47, 41.7% uh, uh, of people using uh, heroin, according to this particular study in 2003, uh, were people of uh, who had a monthly income of less than uh, 6,000 rupees. An interesting fact is, as you notice, uh, when the income gets more than 11,500 per month the uh, use drops to 14.7 uh, so and then the next statistics as well where it says 45.1 percent of uh, the people who use heroin are uh, not educated so that uh, plays a huge role in uh, understand for us to understand the demographics of people who abuse heroin these are not people who are um, very educated or aware and these unfortunately fall trap to heroin use it is very cheap to get uh, it is readily available and um, this is the demographic that use it uh, 32 percent 32.5 percent of the uh, people using it were production or labor labor related uh, labor workers most common uh, demographically in Pakistan is used in Balochistan and KPK region so how does heroin look and we will show you examples in the next slide uh, heroin can be uh, a white or brown powder there's uh, it can also come in a form which is called black tar heroin which is sticky substance uh, in a form just like tar that's used on you know the roads uh, local names uh, unfortunately I was not about uh, not able to find a lot of names uh, I know it's called a uh, uh, Afim and commonly known as powder or powder so uh, the thing with the term powder is okay, this is commonly used for a lot of substances we'll see uh, later on as well uh, when we talk about methamphetamines and other things people would refer okay, to these as powder because they come in a powder form they don't know what 
uh, they're taking. And that's why this presentation is useful for you because you can then identify by the symptoms they're feeling, how the high looks like, and what they uh, what these other character how they consume it. These other characteristics might help us identify what powder they're talking about. Okay, how it's used is smoked in cigarettes, as we talked about. They spoke on an aluminum foil uh, called panni. They heat it up. They smoke the. Uh, they inhale the uh, fumes. Um, they also uh, inject it. So uh, once again, next slide will show. They usually what people do is take a spoon. They put the uh, heroin powder or um, heat it up with some drops of water. Um, it becomes a paste which can then be taken into a syringe and people inject it into uh, their veins or muscle and uh, finally people also snort it uh, through their nose um, and this applies for all um, drugs uh, overall that obviously and it makes sense that uh, the more invasive the procedure to uh, use the worse it is for their health so uh, and the stronger the high or the buzz or the effects of the medication or the drug are so um, smoking would not be that uh, strong whereas snorting would uh, give an immediate effect stronger but obviously then they, if they inject it it will be stronger and uh, into their muscle and the strongest of all would be when they inject it into their veins so um, those you need to keep those in mind and as you go stronger the problems associated with it increase so here if you look at uh, on the left is as I was talking about you take a spoon you add the powder you heat it up with the lighter it'll become liquid and you take it into a syringe and you um, inject it. Uh, this is one example of a brown powder and this is white powder. Both are heroin um, and can be used. Then I was talking about black tar heroin which can be seen over here. Uh, it's just like a rock tar um, crumbles and can be used. Uh, over here the whole uh, you know inhalation through uh, what we called uh, panni is shown um, in this picture where a man is using a straw uh, to inhale uh, these fumes off the heated up heroin from and someone else is heating up the foil uh, underneath okay sorry moving on uh, how does heroin feel so this is one of the stronger uh, substances it's a hard drug uh, compared to like cannabis and alcohol which are known as uh, which are not known as hard drugs but this is uh, a hard drug when you uh, consume it or inject it you have a rush feeling um, of euphoria you have warmth throughout the body you have instant pain relief uh, because this is from the opioid family. Opioid family uh, medications, opioids are painkillers such as morphine. So uh, these are primarily used or in the past were used for pain relief. You feel like you're on a cloud uh, and then eventually there's drowsiness and sleepiness. So um, what happens is that you, the first four effects are uh, noticed for uh, 15 to 20 minutes and then you end up into a deep sleep or sedation uh, once you inject uh, heroin. There's also a state called uh, a term commonly used amongst users is called nodding. So what nodding is is that you shift in and out of consciousness um, where you would um, fall asleep and then wake up and then fall asleep again and again. So you would nod and that is uh, something that um, users try to achieve because it's pleasurable apparently um, so what are the dangers associated with it biggest danger uh, with taking heroin is so how i was talking about heroin being an opioid opioid what they do are that they uh, they relieve pain they also slow down your brain but what happens is once they slow down the brain, there are centers in your brain that control your breathing and heart rate. They also slow those down. So when you give, let's say, something like morphine in high doses in uh, a medical 
setting such as uh, during surgery or emergency room you make sure you put a tube in their mouth so that they can breathe they don't choke they don't uh you know uh, they're able to uh, maintain their heart rate and you know breaths but outside you're not able to do it so the problem is let's say uh, when someone injects it especially in their vein that is going that's taking seconds to milliseconds to put into effect because your blood is constantly flowing and pumping right so the moment it enters your blood within seconds it'll be in your brain all over your body so uh people fall asleep with a needle inside them most of the times thankfully they use smaller needles so that's not that big of a problem but uh, these needles, and I'll talk about the second point, these needles can stay inside and uh, can cause what we call collapse of veins. So these veins would collapse and you would not be able to use uh, the drug or inject in the same vein again. So what uh, you would see patients doing is they'll try different veins all over their body. So they'll start with, um, you know, the arm, um, then uh, they do the back of their hand, then they'd go to the other arm and then the leg or with the, you'd be surprised the kind of places people uh, end up injecting themselves just because they've run out of options. Uh, what this does is, and this is one of the signs that you can tell people to identify how you can identify families can identify if people are using or abusing heroin or any other injectable drugs, that they will have what we medically call track marks. So if you have a mark from injection, then you'll have another over here, another here, another here. So one minute they've just made like a track uh, of these dots that they places where they have injected it. So those are a telltale sign of uh, usually heroin abuse. Uh, coming back to the overdose, the problem with it is your mind slows down, your body slows down, you fall into a coma. And that's what overdose happens. I've seen people uh, overdose, uh, unfortunately, in front of me. Uh, where we were in a facility that did not have uh where we were not in a medical facility we did not have tools to intubate pe people so that they could breathe we did not have to uh you know uh, naloxone which is a medication used to reverse uh, the effects of heroin uh, and unfortunately the patient fell into a coma and after two weeks uh, the patient expired and that's what happens because you you don't know how much heroin you are getting so uh, it's not standardized some dealer is dealing you out of their van or like very sh shady situation so you one time you use this much or like a spoonful or whatever like two grams or whatnot and the second time you use two grams, that second time might contain, let's say, 1,000 milligrams. And the first time was 500 milligrams. There's no standard. So you don't know how much uh, can be too much. And also, as tolerance develops, people start using more and more. And the tolerance develops to you feeling the high and the psychological aspects of it. The tolerance usually does not develop to the heart effects felt on the heart and your breathing so you might not be getting high but your breathing at heart might be stopping to an extent where maybe chasing that high would lead you to be in a coma or just just pass away directly so that's very concerning uh thirdly a big problem is as we saw the people who are using it are not of a very high socioeconomic class they cannot afford to buy new needles what they end up using doing is they start sharing needles that is a big big problem because uh, a needle goes into your blood uh into your vein uh, directly comes in contact with your blood if i have any or if someone who is using um, intravenous drugs has any uh, chronic illness or infection such as uh, hiv aids or hepatitis c or any other uh, infection that can very easily get into that syringe and uh, get into through that needle and when the second person uses it the blood comes into the syringe, uh, comes into contact with that infection, that person can get HIV or uh, hep C or whatever uh, disease they have. And dirty needles can cause 
other infections uh, which can cause to which can lead you to amputate your arm or wherever you're injecting it so that is a big big question uh, so even if some a client comes up to you and talks about heroin abuse uh, the first one of the first things to uh, do is to educate them about needles uh, not sharing needles and uh, not using the same needle again okay uh, what are the withdrawal symptoms? So withdrawal symptoms are pretty severe. So we talked about uh, withdrawal symptoms from uh, alcohol and benzodiazepines. Definitely alcohol symptoms, uh, if kick in, can be really life-threatening. Uh, the thing with um, heroin withdrawal is that it is not as life-threatening, but it to the client and the patient, it will feel terrible you will feel really really bad uh you'll have things like restlessness raising heart anxiety shakes shivering uh, sweating not extreme nausea and vomiting uh, you'll have muscle pain and ability to uh and an inability to fall asleep so you really your body really wants to go back to those opioids get that fix because you know one fix will get rid of all of this but the the, the way we deal with it is we live through it uh it will take two three weeks uh eventually once you've detoxed your body will feel better um it is hard it is very difficult and mostly that's why people are admitted into rehab facilities where they can be facilitated uh, to go through this process because it is hard both for the client and their family to see them go through this um uh, what is the treatment detoxification as i said it will take two to three weeks you need to power through and uh, feel better there's a medication called a methadone uh, which is also an opioid anal uh, analog uh, you take this daily and uh, it gets rid of those withdrawal symptoms uh, and you will feel you'll not feel the withdrawal symptoms as long as like obviously you start using the problem with methadone is that we don't have methadone clinics like they do in the US so you have to buy this out of pocket and it is extremely expensive and if you go back and see the demographic of people who use uh, heroin regularly in pakistan they really cannot afford it it's just for people who are able to pay let's say you know four thousand five thousand six thousand uh, rupees per week or even per uh, every other day to um, get into those programs then there's all obviously rehab programs that help and uh, at the end this counseling and therapy that really help in long term uh, to deal with this finally uh let's talk about other opioids because heroin is as we said an opioid which is painkiller and this is more uh, produced in the black market but there's other things that are also produced uh pharmacologically that people abuse um, so one of the things other than uh, heroin is opium known as afim so uh, that is uh, comes from poppy plant and uh, very prevalent as well same demographic uses it uh, used the same way and uh, you know less uh, it's not as strong as heroin uh, but uh, can be uh, can have the similar effects then there's things like uh, buprene uh, norphine, which is uh, brand names over here are bupron or uh, preener or uh, norpin. These are also these are actually ironically used to just like methadone. These are used to uh, take help people with withdrawal effects and um, deal with that. But people still abuse these medications. Um, then there's codeine. Codeine is also a painkiller. You usually found in painkiller medications uh, and cough syrups. Um, uh, a point to note over here is that codeine tablets are here here most probably and uh, how governments are all around the world have tried to combat people abusing these is that the tablets you get you get mixed with acetaminophen, which is basically Panadol. So if you get a tablet, let's say 5 milligrams of codeine, hai, it also has uh, you know 300 milligrams or like 500 milligrams of uh paracetamol or acetaminophen the problem with uh the way it is the other way is to combat uh, addiction 
and substance abuse. So uh, there's a limit to how much uh, Panadol, Paracetamol, or, uh, you know, um, you can take. So usually it is suggested of 500 to 1000 is other uh, than And the codeine in it is very small. So people would have to take multiple tablets to get that high off of codeine. But the problem with that is that they would be exceeding the Panadol or Paracetamol uh, amount in those tablets. So uh, this is a point for psychoeducation for patients who are trying to do this. Can you tell them that you're taking way too much Panadol or Paracetamol in this tablet, which is coming with the codeine, and that is damaging your liver very badly, and that could cause irreversible liver damage from just one dose. A very high dose of acetaminophen and uh, it can cause toxicity. So that is something that you need to keep in mind uh, when someone tells you that they are abusing or using codeine. Then there's a painkiller uh, tramadol that also comes with most of the times um, paracetamol mixed with it but there's uh, tramadol available that does not have paracetamol. It does not have a very high abuse potential but people still abuse it. Uh, usually um, they take it orally uh, in tablet forms. Yeah, what people might do is um, it comes tablet or capsule they open they either crush the tablet or they open the capsule take out the substance and then they snort it uh, to get that effect um, then there's uh, morphine and fentanyl uh, thankfully Pakistan has very regulated uh, really extremely regulated morphine and fentanyl use so these would be just people who have that access people in uh, medical fields who uh, have access to morphine or fentanyl would be uh, abusing these painkillers and opioids uh, usually general public may not any out there uh, coming down to injectables and other psychedelics so uh, psychedelics is our medications which alter your brain that's why they're called psychedelics things like mushrooms uh, according to the research uh, mushrooms are not very common uh, or magic mushrooms are not very common in Pakistan uh, these uh, drugs uh, are usually used by uh, younger people uh, in uh, mostly at upscale or middle class parties uh, and uh, these mostly are hallucinogenics and um, the term used is tripping so you your mind trips and you go on to a trip so that's what it, they are they are uh, commonly uh, these are NDMA sorry receptors uh, receptor agonists so uh, things like ecstasy commonly known as E or even uh, um, MDMA uh, these help you uh, distort the perception of reality you feel uh, music feels better you feel energetic you're dancing you can hallucinate and colors seem uh, vibrant and things like that so uh, these are used uh, once again at parties and st uh, stuff so there's more information over here they have party goers uh, euphoria wakefulness uh, intimacy sexual arousal and disinhibitions there's uh, also alertness reduces fatigue and uh, yeah so the negative effects of uh, ecstasy can be uh, agitation nausea bruxism which is grinding of the teeth people would end up doing this constantly uh, there's ataxia where people cannot walk properly uh, they sweat a lot blurry vision heart rate uh, is increased and um, so yeah these can be happening with typical doses of NDMA once again not regulated so you don't know how much you're taking for each dose usually cl classical cases someone goes to a party a friend gives them a tablet says here you go they use it without knowing what it is uh, then a uh, rarely used drug now is PCP angel dust or dust uh, rarely used in Pakistan gives a very high uh, heightened energy you hallucinate in the medical community uh, what uh, angel dust or PCP is known as is that uh, if someone has taken PCP by the end of the night they would either be in the hospital or they would either be in jail because that is how strong the effects of hallucinogenics and the alertness and the uh, psychosis there is that they either end up in the hospital or they end up uh, committing a crime and the police takes them in 
Finally, there's uh, ketamine special K. This is basically a horse tranquilizer uh, used in the medical field for sedation. Uh, you basically inject it. You can also snort it, but in Pakistan, you can get it from pharmacy. Uh, people inject it either into their uh, muscles or in their veins. The same problems uh, as we talked about with heroin, injecting into veins. Even though overdose on this is uh, very difficult, but this can have extreme psychological effects. Uh, how the psychological effects uh, of this are that uh, it is a dissociative anesthetic. What happens? is that uh, the, the word it's explained itself that it dissociates your mind uh, from your physical body so you will be laying down um, straight not moving while your mind would be functioning and thinking of things so you will trip you will hallucinate there's something called a k-hole where you're very static and you travel around the world in your mind and you see things and imagery usually very religious uh imagery pops up so uh very uh common once again at parties uh raves and with uh people who are uh, with a hippie culture okay uh finally moving on to something which is uh these days uh, making uh, a lot of news and other cases that people are talking about. You'd, you'd have seen a popular case uh, recently in the news, uh, which was about methamphetamine uh, in Pakistan. Is, the street name is ICE. Uh, makes you do a lot of uh, crazy things. Uh, a popular um, you know, a uh, phrase uh, worldwide is meth not even once. So of all the other drugs, people are uh, people are still relatively safe doing heroin once in their life. But meth is just, methamphetamines are just such a strong drug that just taking them once can ruin lives. Uh, there are some horrific pictures online you can see of people uh, who have abused this drug for a long time and that can really ruin lives. So uh, it is the uh, use of uh, ice or methamphetamines is on the rise in Pakistan. The highest prevalence uh, is in Balochistan and KPK. Uh, the typical user is middle-aged male with moderate education. Uh, it is uh, the the rise is in uh, the rise of use is in college students and professionals. And when we talk about the effects, we can see why these uh, this demographic is affected or is attracted to its drug. Um, according to a survey done last year in 2018 in uh, Karachi, uh, and this is very surprising, is that. Um, Almost 74% of the people were aware of ICE, both genders. 68.5% uh, people, uh, of uh, people knew of someone who had used or is using ICE uh, currently. And um, most of the information people have also gotten about ICE was over the internet. And that's why younger and middle-aged people have more access and uh, knowledge about it. How is it... Uh, so how does it look? It looks again, once again, most of the, like most of these drugs, uh, like a white crystal, uh, white crystals or powder, uh, can be slightly yellow in uh, color as well, depending on uh, how it's made. Uh, usually made in a lab somewhere. Uh, it's a chemical compound um, with no longer medical implications, so not used as medication unlike benzodiazepines or uh, opioids. Um, local names, ice, meth, crystal, uh, apparently the name called Shabu, uh, mostly in Sindh. Uh, this is also called speed, and once again, the common term powder, which can be confused between this or heroin. So um, how is it smoked? Once again, smoked in cigarettes, uh, aluminum files. This is a drug this is, which has a special pipe. It has a glass pipe that people smoke it in. So um, it's called a meth pipe. Uh, and also people inject it into their veins or muscles and they can be snorting uh, this as well. So in this picture, uh, and these uh, these two pictures are actually all these three pictures are from Pakistan. This is how the drug looks like, and that's why you can say you can see why it's called ice. 
because it looks like ice. Uh, this is a meth pipe. It's a glass pipe with a round head. Uh, you add the uh, crystals in it, heat it up, you inhale, um, and you get high. Uh, once again, this is how it looks like. Chote packets, uh, people would sell it. It's very cheap, apparently. Uh, you could get this much for uh, under three, 400 rupees. And this is a makeshift um, bong from a documentary uh, that I saw in, from Pakistan. Uh, so you see how they've used a water bottle or a soda bottle. They're heating it up on aluminum foil. They're taking the fumes go in from this end, uh, go in uh, the water and then come out of the water filtered through this other pipe and you inhale it. So this is what a makeshift bong would look like. How does it feel? So uh, why are people attracted to it? Why are college students attracted to it? Why are people such as accountants or investment bankers or people who have long shifts are attracted towards it is because of these things. It gives a boost of energy. It increases alertness a lot so you are very vigilant uh, but at the expense of causing agitation you're very agitated uh, can high potential, very high potential to cause psychosis. So you might, you know, hallucinate. You might, um, you know, be paranoid or things like that. Um, there's also, uh, you know, uh, euphoria and a feeling of rush. This increased heart rate and breathing. Uh, so the alertness and the boost of energy it keeps you up for. Can sometimes, depending on the potency, can keep you up for days. So that's why people use it. Uh, exams are and log excuse use got the news may article tha. People use an excuse. Uh, students use an, it as an excuse that uh, you know we have to study a lot, and that's why we'll use this to keep us up for a couple of uh, you know 12, 13 hours. So what are the dangers associated with it? Uh, the dangers associated with it are permanent psychosis just with one dose it can cause permanent psychosis this is a very very strong drug and um just to give you an example of uh, the origins of this uh this was used by nazi germany in world war ii by their soldiers so that they could fight more they could not feel the pain they could keep on going and they would follow orders and kill a lot of people so uh that's where it got its popularity. Uh, it can change um, the structure of your brain very early on and you can have permanent effects for your life. Um, you, when psychosis kicks in, you can commit a crime, you can hurt someone, you can uh, drive over someone, you can uh, do things that you would not do uh, um, when you're sober, uh, but that would not be a defense in court. So if you, for, for instance, you know, murder someone or shoot someone, you can go serve serious time in jail because uh, of that. So th those are things to consider. This extreme weight loss. If you uh, search uh, online pictures of like meth addicts, uh, you'll see uh, extreme. They would be they lose a lot of weight. Uh, they they pick on their skin. So they'll have these marks on the skin and. Uh, they would peel off their skin just because they think that there's uh, something on their skin it has terrible terrible effects on teeth you people lose their teeth your skin uh, is terrible your hair falls off it does reach it you know ra uh, reaches a havoc on your uh, physical uh, body as well as your mental state so very very dangerous drug uh, which people apparently are taking very lightly in Pakistan what are the withdrawal symptoms? So uh, when you stop using this, you'll have uh, something called dysphoria, uh, dysphoria, which is easy uneasiness, feeling of uneasiness. You don't feel comfortable. You're very annoyed. You're very, um, you know, just unhappy. Uh, you have anhedonia, which is lack of interest in anything, just like in depression. You have fatigue. You sleep way too much because you've been so active in the past you've agitation anxiety depression suicidal thoughts so think of it as uh, when you're under the influence that you have things like a manic phase of bipolar whereas when you are withdrawal you have uh, the, the depressive phase of bipolar so someone might seem like they have manic depression uh, depression or they might have um, bipolar too but 
you need to screen them for uh, methamphetamine or ice use and we need to tell people about these dangerous consequences of it what is the treatment detoxification um, you know social and family support counseling and therapy possibility of um, a rehab facility uh, admission and then uh, you know refer to a psychiatrist who might give them medication such as anti uh, depressants antipsychotics or benzodiazepines or a combination of all uh, three or two just to calm them down ease the withdrawal once they're detoxifying okay uh, then we come to another medication which is similar and this is uh, a lot of clients use the uh, this and that's what I um, you know thought that it would be important to add this a medication called methylphenidate commonly known as Ritalin once again same demographic uses it uh, college students uh, more often seen more in uh, upper middle class and uh, private colleges in Pakistan it's a medication used for ADHD or ADD in children and adults uh, it has similar backgrounds as amphetamines but it is not it does not have the physical features of using methamphetamine um, so uh, who is the typical person and this is once again according to research typical person who uses this in Pakistan is a 36 year old married woman uh, with moderate education uh, defined as primary or middle so this is also very concerning and these are people who were prescribed this medication uh, after children it was for women and uh, an interesting if you go into the history of Ritalin or methylphenidate uh, when it was first introduced uh, there were posters and ads and you can look them up uh, on uh, online that they were the medication was pushed to people uh, mostly housewives uh, and there's very you know uh, sexist ads uh, online where there's like a woman who is vacuuming and they say oh tired of doing household chores why don't you try some Ritalin uh, just because it has the same effects uh, with less physical effects but alertness uh, boost of energy you can work for longer you feel better you uh, feel uh, you can uh, do more things uh, with more concentration and you can see how that comes into play with ADHD but if you do not have ADHD then you should not really be taking this so uh, once again in college students and professionals it is very common uh, you can get it through pharmacies uh, now a lot of pharmacies do not keep this because they don't want people to abuse it so uh, thankfully but you can find it in the black market um, or if you know someone in the pharmacy who can uh, supply you that. Uh, the abuse, thankfully, according to research, has been uh, going down in the past 10 years. My understanding would be that uh, because not a lot of people know about it and the awareness is being, uh, there's more awareness, but also for the fact that people are shifting to cheaper options, which are ice, which gives a stronger um, buzz and, um, is very detrimental way worse than Ritalin anyways uh, how does Ritalin look this is uh, right now Novartis is the only company selling Ritalin in Pakistan uh, Novartis uh, is formed in 10 milligram tablets uh, this is how it looks like it's a white uh, tablet with A or B um, in the street it is known as R or vitamin R um, at least in the US uh, mostly over here it's called Ritalin how people take it is just like how you take a pill swallowed or you can crush it and snort it as well for immediate action and uh, so how it feels like we talked about it already this alertness uh, kick, kick in of energy there's a mild rush and euphoria associated with it and that's why that demographic of people take it what are the dangers associated with it permanent changes once again very similar to uh, meth but on a smaller level uh, changes to brain uh, structure and function there's huge dependence people might be dependent and then if you don't get that so if people who are not prescribed this medication right uh, they don't have a supply of it they can't go to a doctor and get it prescribed 
And once you cannot find, if your dealer or your pharmacy runs out of it, then you cannot find that medication and then dependence would be uh, really big of a problem. It can also be a gateway drug to ICE as, I t uh, as we talked about, uh, where people develop uh, tolerance to methylphenidate. They cannot afford getting 50 rupees a pill, uh, you know, and it's not giving them the same uh, effects. They, someone says try ice or, metal, uh, or methamphetamine, uh, they try ice, they feel a huge, huge difference, very, very stronger, and then they go, go get hooked at cheaper option, which is ice, but it's very dangerous. Anyway, these are uh, people who use it also need to know that this chronic uh, use can be associated with um, heart troubles, so there's hypertrophy of the heart and even people, even kids who are prescribed it for ADHD are, um, can have these and there's actually long-term studies that show that Ritalin or methylphenidate is very detrimental for your heart uh, and that's why, uh, you know, there's a balance that needs to be taken uh, even with people who are suffering from ADHD. Uh, so what are the withdrawal symptoms? Very similar, uneasiness, lack of interest, fatigue, sleep, agitation, anxiety, depression, same things, but on a smaller scale than uh, it was from uh, meth. Detoxification, counseling, it's very similar. Uh, does not really need a rehab uh, unless the problem is really severe, uh, but it uh, would really help if a psychiatrist assesses them. Uh, they could put them on antidepressant, anti-anxiety, or antipsychotics as well if needed. Uh, finally, cocaine. Uh, this is, uh, according to the UN study, uh, the least commonly used drug uh, or the least commonly used mainstream uh, drug of abuse in Pakistan. One of the reasons I personally believe that it, that is, is uh, cocaine is usually produced in South America, Latin America, uh, and it is really hard to get cocaine in here. Even in the US, uh, cocaine is a drug which is uh, usually reserved for uh, the elite. It is a very, very expensive drug. Um, to obtain, and that's why um, Pakistan does not, not a lot of people in Pakistan can afford it, so not a lot of people use it. Research shows that a um, typical person using is in its mid 30s to 40s and is a male with moderate education. Uh, the only people I've seen uh, use cocaine over here are wealthy landlords or I've seen come across a couple of cases with people like that who were being who had the money of course uh, and where someone was selling them cocaine uh, surprisingly uh, Kashmir uh, Azad Kashmir had the most number of cocaine users in Pakistan so here uh, how does cocaine look like it's a white powder or a white rock which is crack cocaine, uh, local names, coke, uh, cocaine, crack, and once again, powder. Uh, how is it used? Uh, majorly used as snorting, but can be also, once again, melted down, injected, and smoked in a pipe. So uh, if we go here, uh, picture number one is the classic definition or classic picture of cocaine you see in any, any movie or um, uh, any TV drama where uh, you have the powder, you have a razor which you, with which you make lines, which is in picture number two here, and you roll up a $10 bill or whatever you have and you uh, snort it uh, through your nose. This uh, The bill is called, uh, or anything you use to snort is called a snorter. Um, Finally, picture number three, this is in rock form, this is crack cocaine, this is usually smoked in a pipe, very similar to a meth pipe, it's a glass pipe, you heat it up and you smoke. So uh, crack cocaine is cheaper than uh, this high grade powdered cocaine. The problem with cocaine in Pakistan, as we will talk about uh, in a bit, is that it is not pure most of the times. So how does it feel like? Uh, increased vigilance and alertness, boost in confidence, rush, euphoria, sense of well-being, hyperactivity. You, the moment you snort it, after a minute or two, you feel very active, agitated. You're like alert. You're looking around. You can work for longer. You have uh, a boost of confidence. All these things that uh, you know kind of make you, you know, 
able to perform better on the surface at least. Uh, dangers associated with it. Once again, permanent uh, brain structure uh, changes and functioning changes. Financial losses. It's a very expensive drug. Like if you get a fix or two fixes or three fixes for 10,000 rupees or even more because uh, depending on the quality. So you can really go down a rabbit hole financially and lose a lot of things. Um, overdose can actually increase your heart rate to an extent where you will have a cardiac arrhythmia and a heart attack. Um, and this is what I was talking about in Pakistan because uh, cocaine is, um, not a lot of cocaine is available. People mix it with things like methamphetamines, ice or any other thing. So you don't know what you're having and that's really problematic as well. Uh, can be cut with other drugs. Uh, there's dependence just like other drugs and once again, heart problems with chronic use like we talked about in methylphenidate. Okay, so what are the withdrawal uh, symptoms of um, Cocaine, very similar to depression, anxiety, fatigue, difficulty concentrating, um, increased sleep, increased appetite, and increase uh, in vivid dreams, uh, mostly nightmares. Uh, treatment, uh, very much the same, detoxification, uh, social support, family support, uh, referral to a uh, psychiatrist who might see medical uh, help is not really needed in um, such cases. Uh, Counseling and therapy, once again, very important. Uh, okay, uh, finally, we've covered all the drugs that uh, were in the list. Uh, some uh, key points now is uh, are other drugs, this um, uh, very less used in Pakistan. There's uh, something called LSD acid. Uh, so you drop acid, it's usually on paper blotters, you put it on your tongue, or it's in liquid form, you literally drop with a dropper. Um, it's a long-acting uh, drug, so you might have you might trip for up to 12 hours. Uh, very vivid dreams. You'd see colors. So how it works is it's psychedelic. So you see, uh, you kind of uh, some people have uh, who have used it say that you can almost uh, see sounds and uh, hear visual things. So uh, it's very trippy. Uh, substance um, that is uh, not commonly used. Then there, uh, something that is uh, a little more common in Pakistan is solvents and glue sniffing. So someone born is a brand of glue that people, uh, kids, once again, young kids who uh, do not have a lot of money, uh, they'll get the glue, they'll heat it up, there'll be fumes in the glue uh, that will be released, uh, and then they wear a paper bag on their face so that all the fumes can be um, taken in uh, and they can inhale them. And a few problems, these are very toxic, they can damage your lungs, anything. Also, once you put a paper bag or uh, once you put a plastic bag on your over your face, you can kind of choke yourself and you can die instantly. So that is a problem. And there's other stuff which is not as hardcore but very prominent. Things like uh, snuff, which is chewing tobacco, commonly known as in KPK region as Niswar and in Karachi region as Gutka. Um, while not a hard drug like others, it can it has its own milieu of uh, things that can go wrong, especially with mouth cancer and uh, dependence on tobacco and nicotine. Um, finally, uh, the also younger people once again use cough syrup. Uh, cough syrup has uh, codeine in it, which we talked about when we talked about opioids, but some cough syrups also have something called dextromethorphan or DMX. Uh, also, psychedelic people use it to trip, uh, similar to acid or uh, when we talked about ketamine, people would see things uh, and hallucinate if you think, drink a lot of it. But the problem with that is that when you're drinking cough syrup, that's not the only chemical that's going into your body. So you have um, a variety of other things that are uh, you're ingesting when you take these uh, things. So that's dangerous and also can cause injuries. Uh, like other drugs uh, we talked about. So uh, with that, we kind of, uh, I covered all uh, aspects or major drugs that uh, there were. I know, I'm sorry, this lecture's already been too long. Um, 
but I really hope that it was useful. Some of the departing words uh, that I would say about uh, counselors and doctors uh, that we, when we see patients in addiction, we are uh, here and we should be here to not judge someone. Uh, addiction is a disease just like uh, there is diabetes. You don't blame someone who is overweight uh, and do not or refuse to treat them just or judge them just because they did not take care of their diet and now they have type 2 diabetes or hypertension or cholesterol levels. You have to be non-judgmental. We have to be welcoming to these people, especially those who are reaching out to us. These people want to change. These people uh, should uh, be helped without um, us you know, judging them or without us, um, you know, criticizing them. They made choices. Everyone makes choices in their life that they uh, would regret. But we should be here as healthcare professionals to help them and to, uh, you know, make them feel better. Uh, with that said, uh, another thing that I would want to talk about is with counseling. When we talk to people, uh, not and uh, where we started this lecture saying that only 30,000 people uh, can get help. Uh, the facilities for uh, helping people with addiction are only 30,000 when people who are dependent were uh, around 4.3 uh, million people in Pakistan. A lot of people, a lot of these rehabs are very expensive. Even middle class families, even higher upper middle class families cannot afford to send people in there. What happens is they abandon the kid or they just let them suffer from addiction. That does not have to be the case. A lot of these uh, are uh, in fact manageable. Uh, what we need to do is we need to encourage people, uh, we need to encourage the family to come together and uh, for them to help the individual. Our society is very family oriented and family can play a huge role in the improvement of uh, or the betterment of their um, loved one, especially when uh, most of the later drugs we talked about were in younger people. Our, our social structure is so that these people live at home. Um, we need to help the parents come up with better parenting techniques. We tell them this, these signs and symptoms we learned about their drug. Most of the times they don't even know what drug their uh, kid is using or their child is using or their you know spouse is using. We need to let them know what the dangers of that drug is. We need to let them know how they can affirmatively address or confront the child or the uh, person uh, abusing drugs. They need to form a better system where the client does not feel judged and is welcomed back into the family or the social structure they're in. So uh, this is really important. Uh, focus on family therapy, focus on individual therapy, set goals for them and uh, give them hope. There's always hope. Uh, and uh, furthermore, once again, reiterating, uh, let's not be judgmental and do not, um, we should all welcome these people and try to help them. Okay, uh, I have left my email address over here. If uh, you have any questions, feel free to email me and um, I would happily um, answer those questions. So thank you for your time and uh, until next time.